Welcome back to Effective Field Theory and the Renormalization Group. The last time we began with introducing renormalization group and we started with an observation. The regularization implies that we need to introduce an artificial mass scale mu, but it turns out that this mass scale mu is unphysical because it can be absorbed into the bare action in a slightly modified way by defining what we called even more bare parameters and fields. In this way, it becomes manifest that mu must drop out of all physical observables and also must drop out of green functions if we use appropriately normalized fields. And uh, the outcome are running couplings, which are those mu dependent couplings which leave these very bare uh, quantities constant. And we have determined uh, the definition of these running couplings and today we will continue with analyzing them and then derive the, what is really called the renormalization group equation, which gives the name to the field. All right, so that is, where are we? Yep. Let us begin with deriving what is called renormalization group equation. And we have determined those mu dependent running couplings, g of mu, m square of mu, and uh, also a field normalization, small z of mu, which gives the normalization of these very bare fields. And uh, the notation is specific to phi to the four theory, and in all examples we will use phi to the four, but the method is completely general. So they are now defined as before, such that these very bare quantities are constant. And then we can define a family of theories. Namely, a family of theories which depend on this artificial mass scale mu. So for any mu, we can define an action which uh, depends on mu, S of mu. Uh, an action which is an action out of the renormalized quantities. So it depends on the renormalized field phi, the renormalized coupling G of mu, the renormalized mass M square of mu. And uh, also uh, it might depend explicitly on mu. And it is defined as the bare action from before, this very bare action S bare. So, and uh, the bare action is actually mu independent, but nevertheless the formula, the dependence and the relationship between uh, these mu dependent G of mu, M square of mu, and uh, the action that depends on mu. But the values are then mu independent. So that is this S bare from before. And uh, so we can write it explicitly, so this bare action was defined as a functional of these very bare quantities. And so just to make it explicit, it depends really on this very bare field, which however is an abbreviation for square root of small set of mu times the renormalized field and the bare coupling constant, which is this mu to the two epsilon times g plus delta g, which is really a function of mu and uh, g and so on for the mass as well. So in this way, you see that indeed mu uh, may appear explicitly and uh, also the bare action is a power series in the coupling constants and so on. But the whole thing is mu independent. So this family of theories defined for any mu give mu independent physical answers. Therefore, we know the following thing about green functions. First of all, um, there are green functions which are expectation values of these very bare fields. Let's say n of those field operators defined as time ordered expectation value of the bare field operators. These green functions are manifestly independent of mu.
that is the outcome of the previous analysis. And as a result, of course, physical quantities, S matrix elements, mass values, pole masses, and so on, they are, of course, also mu independent because they follow from the green functions. But now there are uh, actually more interesting green functions, namely the renormalized green functions, which are the expectation values of the renormalized fields, time ordered expectation values of the renormalized fields. So what is the uh, advantage of those green functions compared to these ones? The advantage is that they are finite. In a renormalized theory, it's exactly the point of the renormalized fields that they generate finite green functions. So these are finite. They are not because they uh, are expectation values of the bare fields uh, and they are in general divergent. And uh, so this is finite. But also, um, it is clearly related to the bare green functions because the fields only differ by a normalization. So therefore, um, that is given by, or maybe let's write the opposite relationship, which is nicer. So these bare green functions are, of course, square root of small z of mu to the power n times the renormalized green functions because that is the simple relation between the field operators. So therefore, this is a trivial statement. So now in combination, we have uh, three statements, namely the bare green functions are mu independent and therefore also physics. The renormalized green functions are finite and the two differ just by a normalization factor and this normalization factor is of course again divergent. So, and out of these three pieces of information, we can derive the renormalization group equation. We can now take a total derivative with respect to L and mu. And by the way, when I said here mu independent, I mean in the sense of total derivatives. So it's totally mu independent in the, in the sense that you do not look at the explicit mu dependence, but you look at the total mu dependence, including the implicit mu dependence of all these coupling constants which appear. So, therefore, the total derivative here of the left-hand side of this equation is zero. And uh, so then the total derivative on the right-hand side is also zero, but we can work it out. So this total derivative with respect to L and mu of square root of z of mu to the power n times with this green function and this maybe better notation or more clear, clear notation that vanishes. So now we should um, understand that the green functions are functions um, of all the quantities of the theory. So they, in the renormalized theory, they depend on the renormalized coupling constant. They are, of course, a power series in the renormalized coupling. They might depend also on the mass square parameter. They might also depend on mu. Um, and also they depend on momenta, but they do not matter for our current discussion. So, but uh, in this way, we can now work out the total derivative with respect to mu. And here we have a derivative with respect to mu. Here we also have a derivative with respect to g and then an inner derivative and so on. So to work it out, we simply get the following. Zero is equal to the following object, which just acts on this green function. Namely, what do we get? So if we work out the derivative, then we get first of all total derivative of mu acting on the square root of z in the front. That gives us simply n times the to uh, total derivative of square root of z with respect to L and mu. And that derivative was defined as the gamma function. So the derivative here simply gives n times the gamma function times the original square root of z. So here we have plus n times gamma from this derivative. Afterwards, after taking the derivative, the square root of z can be factored out of the whole equation and it can be canceled between the left-hand side and the right-hand side. 
But here from that derivative, we simply get n times gamma, where gamma is the total derivative of square root of z. What else do we get? Every other derivative acts on the green function, and first we get a partial derivative with respect to ln mu of the green function. Then we get plus the derivative of the green function with respect to the coupling times the inner derivative. The inner derivative is the beta function, so we get beta function times the partial derivative of the green function with respect to the coupling. Then we get a derivative of the green function with respect to the mass times the inner derivative, and that gives the anomalous dimension of the mass. So plus, let's check the sign, gamma of m square times the partial derivative with respect to ln m square. And that is the result. And so we get from the previous kind of trivial equation, this more complicated looking differential equation of the green function. And these two equations are the renormalization group equation. In particular, the second one is really called the renormalization group equation. And my recommendation is that uh, you can memorize both, of course, but uh, you can, it is enough to memorize the first equation, which is more obvious, but you can always work it out to get the second equation. Now, um, why is the second equation actually the more famous equation? And why is it, in the end, the more interesting and useful one, and maybe even the more fundamental one? Because it has a property which the first one doesn't have, and this is the property of finiteness. The second equation is manifestly finite. There are no divergences at all anymore in the second equation, whereas in the first one there is, for example, the divergent square root of z. And so these objects here are divergent, but everything which appears in the second line is finite. So let's write this down, considering the limit epsilon going to zero. So the second equation, uh, all terms are finite which is a big advantage, and that is why the equation is ultimately the useful one for understanding what is the physical impact of the renormalization group. So this is the advantage of this second equation, which is the actual renormalization group equation. As a byproduct, we see from this that, in particular, the beta, gamma, and gamma m square functions, they must be finite as well. Otherwise, the equation would be inconsistent. Okay, so this is the renormalization group equation. It is, therefore, a differential equation which tells you what is the mu dependence of a green function, or more generally, of um, objects in our quantum field theory. And you see that the mu dependence can be described in this way. If you change mu, you can compensate the change of mu by changing the coupling and the mass and the normalization of the fields in a certain way. So this is the way to read the equation. Because the total thing is zero, so mu change is equivalent to a simultaneous change of these three quantities in a certain way, with certain relative prefactors. Now, one thing which comes out of the derivation automatically and which is very, very important is the universality of the beta and gamma functions, because the beta and gamma functions are objects which you calculate or which are defined once and for all, and then the same beta and gamma functions are valid for any green function in the theory. So it would be a much more trivial statement to say that for every green function I can somehow compensate a change of mu, but it's a highly non-trivial statement that the compensation is done in a universal way which is the same for all green functions. Let's highlight this as well.
Okay, any questions to the renormalization group equation? Yes. So if we would have to make a change in the scale of the theory, so like changing the mu, we would need to integrate this equation? Yes, yes, that would be the procedure, yes, indeed. Mm -hmm. There are sometimes also other ways, but indeed that would be the most straightforward thing to do. Yes. If we had more parameters in our theory, would there be more gamma functions? And more yes. The yes. So there would be, in general, one beta function for each parameter of the theory, and or one gamma function. In the end, the difference between gamma and beta function is not really significant, because all of them are somehow parameters of the theory. And there would be beta functions for each of them. Maybe even matrix-valued uh, kind of beta functions. Since, I mean, every beta function for every parameter will be then a function of all the other parameters. So in certain approximations, you can write it like a matrix. But yes. OK. Then the next point. the computation of the beta and gamma functions. And we did that actually yesterday in the exercise. So I will summarize here the outcome of the exercise and give a few more remarks. Before beginning, let me clean the blackboard. So Let us simply develop the basic procedure, which is the one we also used in the exercise. And uh, let's illustrate it for phi to the fourth theory again. And uh, as always, use the MS bar scheme, and the derivation is specific for that. So then, in this case, we have this very bare coupling constant, which is given by mu to the power Xi times epsilon, where here Xi is 2 in the phi to the 4 theory, and uh, times um, G plus delta G. And delta G, we write it now as a power series in the coupling constant. So it is a power series of the form A M A N M G to the power N divided by epsilon to the power m, and uh, n and m are bigger or equal than 1. So what that means, oh, um, let's, uh, sorry. let's factor out the g times 1 plus this sum. Then um, at the one loop level, we overall have a term in delta g of the form g square at uh, the two loop level g cubed, and so on. And uh, at every order of g, we have some polynomial in 1 over epsilon. But we really, in the MS bar scheme, have only terms with poles. We do not have finite terms. So the power of epsilon in the denominator is always 1 or higher. So this is the general form of this delta g. It's some power series in 1 over epsilon and the coupling. And we can, act, so we had that also in the exercise, but now we uh, simplify it a little bit because what is really only important for the derivation is the power in epsilon. So let's only say m is bigger or equal to 1. In the denominator, we have epsilon to the power m. And in the numerator, we have some function a m of g. So that summarizes one of these two power series. So the power series in g is abbreviated as a m of g. That makes the derivation a little bit more compact. Similarly, the bare mass square is given by the renormalized mass square times 1 plus a sum m bigger or equal to 1 times a function b m of g divided by epsilon to the power m. And again, here I immediately use these abbreviations functions or power series b m of g, um, where m is the exponent of the 1 over epsilon pole. And finally, set of mu square root is given by mu to the minus epsilon 
times one plus some m bigger or equal to one function c m of g divided by epsilon to the m. Okay. So this is a more compact representation of what we did in the exercise. And now we compute the beta function using a finite ansatz. Because in QED, we already saw from the exercise, which I think you did yesterday, that in QED, there is mu to the one instead uh, epsilon time instead of mu to the two epsilon. And so then you would see that in general, you have mu to some power times epsilon. And uh, then we will see how the xi enters in the calculation. Here, something like that could also appear, um, but yeah, indeed. Yeah, I mean, I agree with that. So uh, as long as the kinetic terms have a, a products of two field operators, this will be the automatic outcome of the kinetic term analysis. Okay, but um, anyway, so you can see how to generalize to arbitrary theories. And uh, the ansatz that we now do is that beta is a function beta of g and epsilon, which however is a power series in G and epsilon. So there is no one over epsilon in the beta function. And why? Because we have just established this. So then the definition tells us that zero should be equal to the partial derivative of the very bare coupling with respect to L and mu plus this beta function of g and epsilon times the partial derivative g bare by small g. And that's it. Uh, this provides us now with three power series. Here a power series in the coupling and one over epsilon, power series in the coupling and epsilon, power series in the coupling and one over epsilon, and uh, the whole thing should be equal order by order. And we did this in the exercise, and let me just write down the result here. We equate the coefficients first at order epsilon, and then we get that beta of g and epsilon is at the lowest non-vanishing order, this xi times epsilon times the coupling itself, g. Yesterday we had minus two epsilon times g, and in general we have minus xi times epsilon times xi uh, times g, plus something which doesn't depend on epsilon, and uh, that let us just call it beta of g. So this is epsilon independent, and then we equate the coefficient epsilon to the zeroth order in this equation, and then we get that this remaining function beta of g, which is independent of epsilon, that has the following form, xi times g square times a1 prime, where a1 prime, a1 is this function here, is nothing but um, dA1 of g divided by or dg. Um, so this is determined by the pole delta G over G, the one over epsilon pole of that quantity. So you see by equating the coefficient, you only get the dependence of the beta function on the very, very first term, A1, in this expansion. All the other terms with higher powers of epsilon do not appear because they do not enter at the order epsilon to the zero. But at this order, you already get a full equation which completely determines the beta function. So therefore, the beta function only depends on the single one over epsilon pole. 
And we had that yesterday in the exercise as well, where we did it explicitly up to the two-loop level. So at the two-loop level, somehow, um, only the one over epsilon coefficient of two-loop mattered. And we see here it works at all orders. And uh, OK, so let's put this into a box. That is an important result. Let me first give an interpretation. The interpretation that you should fix in your mind is uh, that why is the beta function related to the one over epsilon pole? We already discussed it yesterday a little bit, but the very um, first starting point was the necessity for regularization. The necessity for the regularization are the ultraviolet divergences. Because the ultraviolet divergences exist, we need regularization. The regularization automatically introduces a mu dependence. Whereas if there were no regularization, there wouldn't be a mu dependence. So therefore, the beta functions now governs the mu dependence. And so it is not surprising that the value of the beta function is related to the uh, value of the UV divergences. Okay. So and that is exactly the outcome. And uh, only the one over epsilon poles matter. And uh, therefore, there is a further result, which we also already explored in the exercise. Namely, there are now additional consistency conditions. The beta function is already determined at the order epsilon to the 0, but the equation contains epsilon to the minus 1, epsilon to the minus 2 as well. And uh, they must be, all these equations must be fulfilled automatically. And that means that these higher epsilon poles, they are not independent, but they satisfy consistency conditions and they could be predicted. And yesterday we predicted them from lower orders. So the 1 over epsilon to the m poles for m two or bigger appear in the equation above. And they must drop out automatically. So for this reason, we can predict this um, A2, A3, and so on from A1. That's basically what it means. And uh, from A1 is equivalent to saying from the knowledge of the beta function. Once you know the beta function, you can predict all the higher 1 over epsilon square and so on poles of the renormalization constant. So one can make it explicit by deriving some recursion relations. It is not so important how the recursion relations look like. What is important is that they exist. And so once you need it, you can always easily construct the necessary relationships and uh, indeed do the prediction for the higher 1 over epsilon poles. Let me just write down also the similar results for the gamma functions without much comment. So from the definition of the gamma functions, we get gamma of g and epsilon is given by minus epsilon plus gamma of g, where gamma of g is equal to minus xi times c1 prime of g. So this is from the delta z 1 over epsilon pole. So similarly uh, to the 1 over epsilon pole of the coupling renormalization. 
And again, also for the gamma function, there would be a recursion relation. Yeah, CM predicts CM plus one. And uh, similarly for the mass, but there I will not write down anything because it is um, obviously too similar. And we had it, had it in the exercise anyway. So the main point is the principle. The principle of how to compute the beta functions is this one. You have the original definition, namely the total mu independence of these very bare quantities. You work it out and do an ansatz for the beta or gamma functions as power series in the couplings and in epsilon, and then the rest follows automatically. So, any questions to this? Let us illustrate it by going to some explicit theories where we have some explicit results. Again, I need to clean the blackboard, otherwise it will not get dry. So first example is our beloved phi to the fourth theory. So here, delta g over g needs to be known. And uh, where does it come from? It comes from three one-loop Feynman diagrams. So it comes from these three one-loop diagrams which correspond to the one-loop correction to an interaction between these four scalar fields. And uh, each of these diagrams is given by one B0 function, and the B0 function has exactly a one over epsilon pole times one. Therefore, overall, these three add up to three um, over epsilon times the usual one over 16 pi square prefactor and you also see each one has coupling square. So delta g over g has the following result, 3 over 2 times g divided by 16 pi square times 1 over epsilon. The 1 half comes from a symmetry factor that appears in all these three diagrams. But that is the result. So therefore, in this particular case, our coefficient a1, which is the 1 over epsilon, coefficient of exactly this delta g over g is given by 3 over 32 pi square times g. Okay. Then we can use our formula for the beta function for this epsilon independent part. Beta of g was the derivative of that with respect to the coupling g times g square. And uh, so we get then 3 over 16 pi square times g square. And then there would be two loop corrections entire, so plus order g cube. But this is the beta function in the phi to the four theory. And you see, this is the mu dependence of the running coupling constant. Um, so the mu dependence depends on the coupling itself. The mu dependence has a positive coefficient, so therefore if you increase mu, the running coupling goes up. All right, very good. So similar for QED. So for QED, we have this gauge coupling constant E, delta E over E is the renormalization constant which is relevant. And if you remember QED discussions from here or elsewhere, the coupling renormalization in QED is related because of gauge invariance to the photon field renormalization, minus one half delta ZA. And that is then given by one half times the photon vacuum polarization pi gamma of zero. At least in the on-shell renormalization scheme, that is exactly equal but in the MS bar renormalization scheme, uh, at least it is equal for the divergent part. 
the, the divergent part of the renormalization constants is of course always the same in every scheme. And uh, we have already used this uh, pi gamma, and so the result for delta E over E is E squared divided by 24 pi squared times 1 over epsilon in the MS bar scheme. So similar to over there, but the exact prefactor is slightly different, so we have 1 over 24 instead of 3 over 16. So these are typical results. Then uh, our A1 is here given by this E square over 24 pi square, the 1 over epsilon coefficient. But in this case, our xi is 1, as we discussed yesterday in the exercise. So that is this difference in the mu dependence of the bare coupling. And I explained to you yesterday that in phi to the 4, uh, for each loop, there is one power of g. In QED, for each loop, there are two powers of e. And therefore, uh, that explains this xi equal 1 versus xi equal 2. OK, and then uh, the beta function, epsilon independent, is e cubed divided by 12 pi square plus higher orders. Again, uh, the beta function depends on the coupling itself. And by the way, in both cases, it is of higher order. So the beta function is, of course, a power series in the coupling, and it starts at the one loop level. And um, again, here, the beta function is positive. So if the coupling, uh, if mu increases, the running coupling will increase as well. Finally, let us go to QCD. I'm sure you have heard of this, because that behaves differently. So here, without going into the details of QCD theory, so some of you might be in the other lecture on QCD, so there are important contributions from the uh, similar to the photon self-energy. There are now contributions from the gluon self-energy. So gluon is written with these uh, curly lines. So that would be a gluon self-energy with a quark loop. And there are also gluon self-energy Feynman diagrams with gluon loops. There are even more Feynman diagrams, but that are the most interesting ones because they have opposite signs. So this has a sign and a general behavior which is quite analogous to the one in QED, and also the shape of the diagram is really the same. But this diagram is different from QED, and it comes from the self-interaction of these non-abelian gauge bosons. And if you work out the sign, then the sign is opposite. And therefore, the beta function of QCD can have a different sign from the beta function in QED. But uh, whether the sign is different depends on the details. It depends on how many quarks there are and how many gluons there are, which of the two dominates. So, And I will just give you the result. Beta of g in QCD is given by minus g cube over 16 pi square times 11 over 3 times the number of colors minus 2 over 3 times the number of flavors. So here, this is the number of colors, which is 3 in the real world. And uh, that basically tells you how many gluons there are, because how many gluons are there? Uh, does anybody know? Uh, n squared square minus 1. So in the real world, there are eight different gluons, which can propagate in the loop. And uh, here, this is the number of quark flavors. And in the real world, this is 6, from up quark up to the top quark. And uh, then, in the real world, you indeed have here 11 minus 4 gives something positive in the bracket and overall something negative. So the gluons dominate, and therefore the sign of actual QCD is really negative, whereas in QED we have a positive sign. So this is smaller than 0 in reality. And 
that was a huge discovery and it led to the Nobel Prize for um, the discoverers of this. And uh, a general statement which was quickly found after uh, the discovery of this negative sign was that non-abelian gauge theories are actually the only theories in relativistic quantum field theory uh, where such negative beta functions can appear at all. So only in non abelian gauge theories negative beta functions are possible. And uh, uh, if so, that is the first statement, and then beta smaller than zero in QCD explains asymptotic freedom. which was experimentally um, discovered around 1970. So it was observed that hadrons behave in a way which corresponds to uh, stating that hadrons consist of um, constituents and the constituents at high energy behave like free particles. So a hadron is like a big ball uh, and inside the big ball there are just three objects and if these three objects are hit by a photon they just behave independently. But if you look at the hadron from the outside it's a very strongly interacting bound state. So that looks like a contradiction but exactly that was observed and the observation was explained by the negative beta function in QCD and that gave rise to the understanding that strong interactions should be described by QCD. The only thing that has to do with asymptotic freedom is the overall sign. That is the important point. So where the sign comes from is a different question. So one question can be why is this the resulting formula following from the computation? So that is one question but then of course we should do the calculation in order to see why this leads to that result. Okay, But on the other hand if you accept the result to be negative then it is another discussion, what is the physical implication of a negative beta function? So the running coupling becomes small at high energies, but what does that actually mean in terms of physics? And uh, so that is um, also not yet clear, according, uh, at least not from what we said in the lecture, because we have only defined running couplings, but we have not yet clarified the physical meaning of running couplings. They understood the physical meaning of running couplings and that is why they got the Nobel Prize. You have maybe yet to understand the physical meaning of running couplings. Yeah, but, yeah. Um, but you can think about it for five minutes but then we will do it in the lecture. I hope in a clear enough way. But the other, I don't know what is your question. Is it why yeah, this why, why diagram does, leads to a negative sign or what? Uh, no, why, like, why does the Because this diagram appears for the up quark, down quark, strange quark, and so on. It appears for each quark type and it has always the same result. Therefore, the result of this diagram is simply multiplied with a number of different quark types. Right? Yeah, okay. So that is the simple reason. So you have to sum over all possible Feynman diagrams and here you have to sum over six such diagrams. For each diagram, um, the value of the full diagram might depend on the quark mass, but the 
beta function only needs the one over epsilon pole, which is independent of the quark mass. Therefore, it really is to simply a factor times the number of quark flavors. And by the way, what would happen in QED? That is the result if QED consists only of the electron and the photon. But if you have the electron and the muon, then you would have two Feynman diagrams in the vacuum polarization. Each has the same divergence, and the beta function would be twice as large. If you have also the tau, the beta function would be three times as large. So this is the result for um, only electrons. Otherwise, you would have here a factor nf as well, uh, which is the number of leptons, or even for quarks, you would have the same, but multiplied with a charge of the quark. Okay, so this explains the factor nf, and the number of gluons here enters in a more complicated way, but uh, similarly, clearly, you can understand the diagram will depend on how many gluons there are. More technically speaking, the diagram involves group structures, the Feynman rules contain these structure constants F, A, B, C, um, and in the end you need to work out some group theoretical algebra involving these F, A, B, C structure constants, and the result of this depends, of course, on the number of colors. That is how it enters. And very loosely speaking, you can understand the different sign by simply saying that fermion loops always give you a minus one, whereas boson loops do not. Uh, that is just a very rough way to understand that, at least in principle, uh, there might appear different signs. Of course, you know that Feynman rules also have other minus signs as well. But nevertheless, uh, this is the basic point. So I wrote you here the names of the three people, Gross, Wilczek, Politzer, who received the Nobel Prize for this discovery. For sure, they will have different results. Well, yeah, they will have different results, but do any of the relations uh, of characteristic relations that we discussed like in the previous section uh, change significantly, or is it just? I would say, first of all, what changes is that dimensional regularization can only be used in perturbation theory because it depends on Feynman diagrams. Therefore, uh, we should really leave the realm of dimensional regularization and do everything in more general terms. Then, uh, of course, there are formalisms uh, which are quite analogous, but which do not use dimensional regularization. Uh, then most of the things can be done in an analogous and parallel way. But then you would also have a non-perturbative option to define the beta functions. And then uh, in those other more general contexts, not much would change between perturbation and non-perturbation theory. Okay. But everything which directly exploits one over epsilon poles does not apply because it's just limited to the regularization choice. Okay, now uh, you are motivated to understand the physical meaning of running couplings Therefore, let us uh, understand it. first clean the blackboard. Let us first discuss uh, some remarks on physical quantities. Uh, physical quantities could be the observable mass of a particle or uh, probability or uh, the lifetime of some particles, some physical process in general. And all these physical quantities depend not only on these parameters like g and mu and so on, but of course they first of all depend on physical um, quantities like momenta, energies of particles that appear in the process.
So we should take into account the dependence on these physical quantities. Let us visualize this with some example. So that symbolizes a process, for example, a two to two scattering process, but it could also be something more general. And uh, let's give it a name sigma, like a cross section, which depends on the momenta pi. So there are many momenta, it's a set of momenta pi, semicolon, and uh, it also depends on the coupling g of mu and on mu potentially mu appears explicitly in the form of ln mu square that we have seen in our loop calculations. For simplicity, let's neglect the masses. Then uh, this is all we have. So, um, this is now a physical observable. And in the theory, it will be calculated perturbatively as a power series in the coupling, g of mu. And in the power series expansion, there can be ln mu square terms and the momenta pi of the particles can appear. What we have now seen is that the whole thing is in total independent of mu. So we can again write down this trivial form of the renormalization group equation d by the ln mu with the total derivative of this sigma of pi, g of mu and mu, that vanishes. So this is basically the renormalization group equation. And we can equivalently write it with partial derivatives, partial derivative d by d ln mu plus the beta function times the, the partial derivative with respect to the coupling of sigma uh, that vanishes as well. So here, by the way, um, the normalization of fields is irrelevant. It always drops out in the calculation of observables. And uh, if we would not neglect the mass, then there would always be also a term with beta, uh, sorry, with a gamma function of the mass times d by dm square. But let's just drop it, this for simplicity. Now this is uh, known, and now let us um, analyze how the structure of this um, calculation manifests itself in perturbation theory, where the computation here works by a three level plus one loop plus two loop corrections and so on. So what happens actually in perturbation theory. There we have, let's say at three level, zero loop. We would have simply Feynman diagrams like that uh, in phi to the four theory. And we have a result, sigma zero, the three level prediction. And what is actually the dependence of the three level prediction? The three level prediction will depend on the same set of momenta, pi. What else can it depend on? It will depend on g of mu, the coupling constant, because that appears here in the Feynman rule. But what about the explicit mu dependence? Yes, exactly. So that is the point. So there is no uh, explicit mu dependence. That is an important remark. What happens at the one loop level? So there we have one loop correction Feynman diagrams like this, and maybe also counter term Feynman diagrams. In the end, we get sigma one loop. And uh, what is the structure of the one loop correction? So we get uh, something maybe proportional to the lowest order prediction, which depends on the momenta and the coupling. But then we get an additional coupling factor. Let's say 
an additional coupling constant G to some power A. In phi to the four, it would be exactly one additional coupling. In QED, it would be two additional powers of the coupling constant. But in general, we get some additional powers of couplings. And then the result of the loop plus counter terms. And the result of the loop can contain ln mu square. And we know the coefficient of the ln mu square is the same as the one over epsilon of the loops. But then the log argument must be dimensionless. So how can it become dimensionless? It must be accompanied by some other dimension full quantities. But what can that be? Masses or momentum squared. Right, and since we neglected the masses conveniently, it can only be the momenta. So what can happen here is some combination pi, pj uh, of all products of uh, two momenta. And then there can be additional terms which do not contain mu. So mu can only appear in the log. Um, everything else does not contain mu and uh, therefore can also not contain logarithms. So that is the structure. Good. Now, uh, how about the renormalization group equation? So for example, if you now work at lowest order perturbation theory at three level, so sigma zero is the thing in the first line, does it satisfy the renormalization group equation? So sigma zero, partial derivative with respect to ln mu is what at three level? Zero. Is zero. And then partial derivative with respect to the coupling is what? Ah, at three level. Ah, okay, clever. Yeah, very good. <laughs> um, I didn't think that far. But in general, if you plug in um, the three level coupling, uh, the three level result for the cross section, then of course it depends on the coupling. Therefore, this term is non zero. This term is zero. Therefore, it doesn't immediately satisfy the renormalization group equation, but indeed you are right if you now consider that the beta function is of higher order, then it is consistent. But that is in line with what I want to point out, namely the uh, renormalization group equation connects different orders in perturbation theory. So the tree level alone doesn't satisfy it, uh, but you get a term here from three level derivative times one loop beta function, so you get a term which is of one loop order. This would be cancelled by the ln mu dependence of the one loop sigma. So therefore, if you plug in everything, then uh, the ln mu dependence of sigma one loop plus the g derivative of the three level sigma, that is zero. So the renormalization group equation uh, connects different orders in perturbation theory. Sigma zero, sigma one, do not separately satisfy the renormalization group equation, but only in combination. And uh, your statement is important, namely the beta is of one loop order, or one loop or higher order, of course. And so that is why the renormalization group equation connects different orders of magnitude. Now, uh, what can we say about perturbation theory? Perturbation theory at the one loop level contains these logarithmic terms, ln mu square over some products of momenta. These logarithms can be large or small depending on our choice of mu. So the momenta are given by experiment. Now uh, we as theorists have in our control the value of mu. Now uh, we had this already in some exercise. What could be a prefer preferable choice for mu? We would like to optimize our perturbation theory and perturbation theory is probably better behaved if this logarithm is as small as possible as opposed to the opposite. And that means that we should probably take mu square in the ballpark of all the momenta of the process that we consider, 
because then all these logarithms become small and perturbation theory is better behaved. If one loop is small, it means tree level is closer to the truth. And tree level closer to the truth means that this Feynman diagram basically represents the full scattering process. If this Feynman diagram represents the full scattering process, it means that the coupling constant appearing in this Feynman diagram can be thought of as a representative of an effective interaction strength for particles scattering at these energies. Let's write this down. We can optimize perturbation theory by choosing mu square similar to all the products of momenta. Then say um, the full sum sigma one plus sigma two would be approximately equal to sigma zero, which is given by this vertex with the coupling constant g of mu. And uh, the interpretation is that g of mu is an effective let's say interaction strength for processes happening at these energies. That is the role of the running mu. So you see that even though the scale mu is actually first of all artificially introduced via the regularization and we have also proven that it is unphysical, it drops out of all observables in the final end. Nevertheless, the running coupling at the scale mu can be interpreted in a physical way because in this case tree level becomes particularly accurate and describes the full physical uh, behavior so basically all the higher order effects are to a good approximation absorbed in the running coupling G of mu. That is the point. And just to be sure, of course it is still often necessary to calculate higher order corrections and the tree level is not always sufficient. But uh, technically speaking, uh, G of mu absorbs a lot of these logarithmically enhanced corrections. That is what is technically done. And so in this sense, it approximates the truth as well as possible. And uh, it, it is exactly in this sense that it um, corresponds to an effective interaction strength for processes at these energies. And what is the particular value for mu for the standard model we have right now to describe our theories at the best? The best possible choice of mu? Uh, depends on the observable because uh, as you see from the argument, uh, it depends on the momenta of your process. And so um, for a process which happens at the Large Hadron Collider, uh, where the energy is let's say one tera electron volt, then you would probably work in this MS bar scheme with mu set at to one TeV or something similar. Uh, often people consider the decays of Higgs bosons, that is an important class of observables. If a Higgs boson decays, then uh, the important energy scale is given by the rest mass of the Higgs before its decay, and then you would often calculate in the MS bar scheme using mu equal to the Higgs boson mass, similarly for many other processes. And it becomes very difficult if you have a physical process where actually you cannot set mu equal to all products of momenta, maybe because the process has many different momenta, or if you do not neglect the masses, then of course there are mass scales in your theory of light particles, heavy particles. Some particles have large momenta, some have small momenta. Then there is no way to set mu square equal to all of that. And therefore, 
In such processes, there is no effective coupling strength which directly describes uh, the interaction relevant for you. And then we need the um, machinery of EFT plus renormalization group in order to disentangle all the different effects from the different mass scales. This is exactly what we will work out in the next parts of the lecture where we will discuss um, processes of that sort. But that is the reason why I neglected the masses here. So we only have momenta and we assume for this uh, moment that all the momenta are of the same order of magnitude and then uh, this can be set equal simultaneously for all momenta that are relevant and then we have such a, an interpretation. Uh, so as I understand it, the um, normalization group equation is one equation which uh, interplays the mu, um, the g and the m. Mm -hmm. so Well, uh, okay, so everything depends only on mu. So if you change mu, then g changes in an unambiguous way and m squared changes also in an unambiguous way. But they both change simultaneously. And then you would have some running coupling at some scale mu and simultaneously you have a running mass parameter, which is a little bit more uh, difficult, non-obvious to interpret. Um, it's an effective mass relevant for processes at these higher energies. And how I see this from the, this one equation, the, the, the change is unambiguous. This m changes unambiguously with mu. Because uh, dm by dl and mu is given by gamma. That's it. So that is the definition of the running. So the running is unique. Yeah, indeed. So we should discuss this in a little bit more detail because that is important for the applications. Uh, a basic statement is um, a logarithm of a mass means that if the mass goes to zero, you have a singularity. And uh, so you can ask, uh, phrase the question in this way, do you have a singularity for zero masses? And that is maybe a question which can be answered on quite general grounds using some general considerations. For some observables in some theories, the limit zero mass exists and is non-singular. You know, maybe have a Taylor series expansion in the small mass, and then there cannot be an L and M term in the result. For other theories, for other observables, you might know immediately that a zero mass limit doesn't exist, it is singular, and then uh, this is equivalent to expecting that uh, there will be logs of the mass, logs of maybe energy divided by mass or a log of mu divided by the mass. So it depends on whether the limit zero mass is singular or not. And that is related to our discussion of analyticity in uh, the different variables in the large mass expansion and method of regions, where we had loop integrals, applied the method of regions, then we had some hard region, soft region. In the hard region, maybe the result of the hard region calculation is then analytic in the small mass, whereas for the soft integral, there could be the case where uh, the result is non-analytic in the small mass. Whether this soft region exists or not uh, can then be seen maybe depending on the case. We have seen cases where it exists and we have seen cases where it didn't exist. For the photon self-energy that we had, that was a case where the zero mass limit um, Uh, no, sorry, uh, zero momentum limit uh, was finite and where the um, soft region of the loop integral didn't exist. 
So it was immediately clear that the result was analytic in the soft variables. However, there, there was no soft mass. So, okay, maybe not a good example, but it was analytic in the small momentum. Uh, all right, uh, maybe let's see how, uh, oops, uh, time has progressed too much. Uh, let me make sure that at least we continue a little bit with our discussion. Um, I had a choice between two possible continuations. Let's do the quicker one. So anyway, uh, the first, uh, the basic point here should be that you understand why the hell it is at all possible that G of mu can get some physical interpretation. And then you have now made up already quite complicated examples and uh, that such examples exist is the reason why we are here because in order to disentangle them and use them, we need uh, to apply renormalization group techniques, effective field theory techniques together, integrate out some particles, do some zero mass limits for others and so on. But the basic point uh, should be clear. And uh, let us now just uh, exemplify this and do the discussion for QED and QCD a little bit more in detail, as much detail that we can do in the last 10 minutes. So let's consider the case where epsilon has gone to zero and where the running coupling dg divided by d ln mu is given by sorry, uh, this epsilon independent part of the beta function. And uh, let's work at one loop level. And at one loop level, both for QED and QCD, we have the following um, structure, namely the beta function is coupling to the third power times a coefficient. And let's just call the coefficient beta one, where beta one in QED is positive and in QCD beta one is negative. And so it was this one over 12 pi square factor. So it's really simply, uh, constant mathematical number. Okay, so if this is our beta function, then let us now investigate how it runs. Now we know that the running has some physical meaning. We've already seen the coupling increases in QED, it decreases in QCD, but let's work out the running and uh, integrate the renormalization group equation to really get the function G of mu, what it actually is. So how can we do it? So we have a differential equation of the form dg over the ln mu is g cube times a constant. So let's bring it to one side and write dg divided by g cube is given by beta one times d ln mu. Okay. And then we can just integrate and uh, the integral of the left-hand side and right-hand side is easy in both cases. And uh, simply by integrating between two scales, so uh, the integral of that is minus um, one over g square times one half. And uh, therefore we get here one over two g square of mu minus one over two g square of mu zero so the difference between two couplings at two different scales. So uh, since the integral was minus one over two g square, um, on the right hand side we have then minus beta one times ln mu divided by mu zero, or equivalently one over g square of mu minus one over g square of mu zero is given, so we multiply by two and then we simply get mu square in the log, which is anyway maybe nicer, minus beta one times ln mu square 
divided by mu zero square. So it's as easy as that. Uh, that is the integral of the beta function, and now you know how the coupling runs. And we can now plug in the values, constant, positive constant, or negative constant. So what you see, that uh, this one over g square is just a linear function of ln mu. And so we can plot the result. Maybe let's do it next to each other, QCD and QED. So first I would really plot the simple quantity one over g square as a function of ln mu square. Here as well, one over g square as a function of ln mu square. And you see that is also what is done in grand unified theories because the couplings then run in a much simpler way. Okay, so how does it look like for QED? Here, um, beta one is positive. Therefore, uh, if we fix some starting position mu zero, then the mu dependence is one over g square uh, depends as minus uh, ln mu square. So we have a negative slope a linear running with a negative slope. That is just the result. So this is how one over g square behaves. And of course it depends on the starting value, but any of those trajectories is a correct solution to the renormalization group equation. And in QCD it's of course the same but with a positive slope. So these lines are all parallel, they all have the same positive slope. Now uh, what does it mean? Here at some value, because of the linearity, it's unavoidable that uh, there exists a value where one over g square becomes zero. And uh, to the left of that value, one over g square is positive, and to the right it's negative, that makes no sense, but uh, we can run to the left of those zero crossings. So let's give it a name. So this particular trajectory um, goes to zero here at lambda one, and that would go to zero at this lambda three. And then what does it look like if we actually plot the coupling itself, g of mu, as a function of ln mu? Then for this particular trajectory at the value lambda one or lambda three, we would have a pole. The coupling goes to infinity and it behaves therefore like this or like that, or like this. These are the three trajectories. And so to the left, they go to zero smoothly. They simply go to zero. So we see that uh, g of mu goes to infinity at some large mu square. Or, uh, mu square goes to lambda square. And this is called Landau pole. It's the Landau from Landau Lifshitz textbooks. And he was very much worried about these Landau poles and that's why they are called Landau pole. Similarly in QCD, if we plot just the coupling, then of course they go to infinity on the left and the trajectories would look like this. And so to the left, they go to infinity at some value, and to the right, they approach zero smoothly. So we have a pole at some small mu square, but g goes to zero for mu going to infinity. And this is the famous asymptotic freedom. So the coupling doesn't only become smaller, but it actually goes to zero, which means the particles behave as free particles according to our interpretation from before. So uh, particles in QCD, quarks and gluons, uh, behave as totally free particles uh, with respect to processes uh, at very high energies such as if you shoot with an extremely high energetic photon into a proton and the high energetic photon hits a quark inside the proton, then this quark behaves as free. 
and it can leave the proton and feel only much later that, uh, oops, I was actually part of a bound state, but then it's too late. So, and just for fun, I wanted to compute maybe the value of lambda in actual QED. QED. So what is the value of the Landau pole in pure QED, where we know everything. We have experimental values for the starting value of the coupling. We know the beta function, and therefore we can compute the Landau pole. So what we know is E square at the scale mu equal the Z boson mass. That has been measured, and uh, it's often uh, quoted as E square over 4 pi, which is the fine structure constant alpha. So here we have a running fine structure constant alpha, and that is approximately 1 over 128. This is our starting value. Then, what uh, is the value of lambda at which this running coupling becomes infinite? So how can we solve this? We need to go into this equation. Our starting value mu zero is now the Z mass, and we want to ask that G of mu vanishes. So mu becomes lambda, mu zero becomes MZ, or vice versa. So then this would be zero because the coupling is infinite. And here we have our starting value, and here we then get some known solution. So we would say one over, or let's say four pi, divided by E square of MZ square, minus 4 pi divided by infinity, according to the equation, gives minus beta 1 times 4 pi, because I multiply the equation with 4 pi, times ln um, mu square divided by, sorry, m z square divided by lambda square. So what is the result? The result is uh, one over, uh, okay, or let's leave it at that, one over alpha, let's call it one over alpha of mz is equal to plus beta one times four pi times ln lambda square divided by mz square, or we can also solve lambda square is equal to mz square times an exponential, and the exponent is 4 pi times beta 1 divided by alpha of mz, right? Uh, I think that is somehow wrong, because I need to divide by this. The exponent is, of course, instead 1 over 4 pi beta 1 times alpha of mz. Right. Uh, I think that's true. Now, what is therefore the exponent actually, numerically? So beta 1 was again what? Beta 1 was 1 over 12 pi square. So times 4 pi gives 1 over 3 pi. What is 1 over 3 pi? Uh, so yeah, 1 over 3 pi is approximately 1 over 10. That is 1 over 100. So we get 1 over 1,000 in the denominator, so we get 1,000. So it's approximately exponential of 1,000. So that is an astronomically high number. So the Landau pole happens in actual QED at an energy scale, which is far, far above the energy uh, content of the universe. 
Therefore, it's unreachable experimentally, and uh, it doesn't have to worry us too much um, when we want to compare to experiment. But uh, one can think and philosophize about it, what it means for the consistency of the theory. But it's definitely far above any accessible energies. Therefore, for accessible energies, the QED coupling runs and it becomes larger, but only by a very, very mild uh, amount. Well, another thing that is interesting is that this formula is a non-perturbative formula. Maybe you have discussed such functions in mathematics. So as a function of the coupling, all formulas so far in our lecture are perturbative, uh, which means they are power series in the coupling. This is, however, a function which has an essential singularity in the sense of complex functions. So it's rather a power series and with infinitely high powers of one over the coupling. So um, it is an interesting non-perturbative result that we have obtained here from integrating the renormalization group. Yeah. Um, let's say we assume a higher order beta function. Uh, how much does this change? Not much because the beta function doesn't change a lot. But of course, it changes um, uh, most mostly in the region where the coupling is very large. So indeed, um, as long as the coupling is small, so let's say significantly smaller than one numerically, uh, the perturbation uh, theory approach is um, very good. And uh, then once the coupling according to perturbation theory would be much bigger than one, we cannot expect that perturbation theory describes the truth accurately. And that is one uh, discussion of this landau pole issue. Namely, of course, we have absolutely no idea whether the true running coupling goes to infinity or just to something else or to a large constant value or goes to zero again. Because once the coupling is too large, the whole formalism doesn't apply anymore. And therefore, extrapolating the formalism to the point where we actually determine the pole location is uh, stretching it too far. For sure, perturbation theory cannot be applied in the region where the coupling is uh, close to the pole for obvious reasons. There, the higher orders are too important. And I mean, they are more important than the lower orders. Uh, and that is one answer to the discussion of Landau, uh, namely that we actually do not know at all whether such a Landau pole exists. And in order to answer such a question, we would need to do non-perturbative approaches. Yes. Nevertheless, it is interesting to work out the result for the lambda according to lowest order perturbation theory, because at least it is quite clear that um, close to that value, the coupling is still small, and then perturbation theory applies. And so we know that uh, the coupling definitely rises towards values of the order one or higher at energies uh, close to that. And uh, simultaneously, uh, or conversely speaking, at energies a few orders of magnitude below that, the coupling will always remain perturbative. That is maybe the more important statement. And what, are, um, what about those, um, um, those assumptions of, in the God scale, the, all the couplings are converged to one point in supersymmetric models or something like that? Why can we say in there that we have certainty that they... Well, as long as perturbation theory applies because the couplings are small, we can use the approach. And um, that is a consistency question. If you integrate the beta functions and uh, they tell you that the couplings start out in a small value and remain small, then everything is consistent. And you can be sure that non-perturbative effects do not play a role. However, if the renormalization group equation would tell you the opposite, the coupling becomes large according to perturbation theory, then actually you know that you cannot trust the result, but then you just lose control and you would need other approaches if there are any. But for the grand unification discussion, indeed, it has turned out that perturbation theory works. And so we will see it in the exercise. Okay, but uh, since time is up, let us stop here and then see you on Monday.